Hey friends, tonight we are reading A New England Nun by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman. It was late in the afternoon, and the light was waning. There was a difference in the look of tree shadows out in the yard. Somewhere in the distance, cows were lowing and a little bell was tinkling. Now and then a farm wagon tilted by and the dust flew. Some blue-shirted laborers with shovels over their shoulders plodded past. Little swarms of flies were dancing up and down before the people's faces in the soft air. There seemed to be a gentle stir arising over everything for the mere sake of subsistence, a very premonition of the rest and hush and night. This soft diurnal commotion was over Louisa Ellis also. She had been peacefully sewing at her sitting-room window all the afternoon. Now she quilted her needle carefully into her work, which she folded precisely, and laid in a basket with her thimble and thread and scissors. Louisa Ellis could not remember that ever in her life she had mislaid one of these little feminine appurtenances, which had become, from long use and constant association, a very part of her personality. Louisa tied a green ribbon round her waist and got out a flat straw hat with a green ribbon. Then she went into the garden with a little blue crockery bowl to pick some currants for her tea. After the currants were picked, she sat on the back doorstep and stemmed them, collecting the stems carefully in her apron, and afterwards throwing them into the hen coop. She looked sharply at the grass beside the step to see if any had fallen there. Louisa was slow and still in her movements. It took her a long time to prepare her tea, but when it was ready, it was set forth with as much grace as if she had been a veritable guest to her own self. The little square table stood exactly in the center of the kitchen, and was covered with a starched linen cloth whose border pattern of flowers glistened. Louisa had a damask napkin on her tea tray. There were arranged a cut glass tumbler full of teaspoons, a silver cream pitcher, a china sugar bowl, and one pink china cup and saucer. Louisa used her china every day, something which none of her neighbors did. They whispered about it among themselves. Their daily tables were laid with common crockery, their best of the china stayed in the parlor closet, and Louisa Ellis was no richer nor better bred than they. Still, she would use the china. She had for her supper a glass dish full of sugared currants, a plate of little cakes, and one of light white biscuits. Also, a leaf or two of lettuce, which she cut up daintily. Louisa was very fond of lettuce, which she raised to perfection in her little garden. She ate quite heartily, though in a delicate pecking way. It seemed almost surprising that any considerable bulk of the food should vanish. After tea, she filled a plate with nicely baked thin corn cakes, and then carried them out to the backyard. Caesar, she called. Caesar, Caesar. There was a little rush and the clank of a chain, and a large yellow and white dog appeared at the door of his tiny hut, which was half hidden among the tall grasses and flowers. Louisa patted him and gave him the corn cakes. Then she returned to the house and washed the tea things, polishing the china carefully. The twilight had deepened. The chorus of the frogs floated in at the open window wonderfully loud and shrill, and once in a while a long, sharp drone from a tree toad pierced it. Louisa took off her green gingham apron, disclosing a shorter one of pink and white print. She lighted her lamp and sat down again with her sewing. In about half an hour, Joe Daggett came. She heard his heavy step on the walk and rose and took off her pink and white apron. Under that was still another, white linen with a little cambric engine on the bottom. That was Louisa's company apron. She never wore it without her calico sewing apron over it unless she had a guest. She had barely folded the pink and white one with methodical haste and laid it in a table drawer when the door opened and Joe Daggett entered. He seemed to fill up the whole room. A little yellow canary that had been asleep in his green cage at the south window woke up and fluttered wildly, beating his little yellow wings against the wires. He always did so when Joe Daggett came in the room.
Good evening, said Louisa. She extended her hand in a kind of solemn cordiality. Good evening, Louisa, returned the man, in a loud voice. She placed a chair for him, and they sat facing each other, with a table between them. He sat bolt upright, towing out his heavy feet squarely, glancing with a good-humored uneasiness about the room. She sat gently erect, folding her slender hands in her linen white lap. "'Been a pleasant day,' remarked Daggett. "'Real pleasant,' Louisa assented softly. "'Have you been haying?' she asked, after a little while. "'Yes, I've been haying all day down in the ten-acre lot. Pretty hot work.' It must be. Yes, it's pretty hot work in the sun. Is your mother well today? Yes, mother's pretty well. I suppose Lily Dyer's with her now. Daggett colored. Yes, she's with her, he answered slowly. He was not very young, but there was a boyish look about his large face. Louisa was not quite as old as he. Her face was fairer and smoother, but she gave people the impression of being older. "'I suppose she's a good deal of help to your mother,' she said, further. "'I guess she is. I don't know how mother'd get along without her,' said Daggett, in a sort of embarrassed warmth. "'She looks like a real capable girl. She's pretty-looking, too,' remarked Louisa." Yes, she's pretty fair-looking. Presently, Daggett began figuring the books on the table. There was a square red autograph album and a young lady's gift book, which had belonged to Louise's mother. He took them up one after the other and opened them, then laid them down again, the album on the gift book. Louisa kept eyeing them with mild uneasiness. Finally, she rose and changed the position of the books, putting the album underneath. That was the way they had been arranged in the first place. Daggett gave an awkward little laugh. Now what difference did it make which book was on top? said he. Louisa looked at him with a deprecating smile. I always keep them that way, murmured she. You do beat everything, said Daggett, trying to laugh again. His large face was flushed. He remained about an hour longer, then rose to take leave. Going out, he stumbled over a rug, and trying to recover himself, hit Louise's work basket on the table and knocked it on the floor. He looked at Louisa, then at the rolling spools. He ducked himself awkwardly toward them, but she stopped him. Never mind, said she. I'll pick them up after you're gone. She spoke with a mild stiffness. Either she was a little disturbed, or his nervousness affected her, and made her seem constrained in her effort to reassure him. When Joe Daggett was outside, he drew in the sweet evening air with a sigh, and felt much as an innocent and perfectly well-intentioned bear might after his exit from a china shop. Louisa, on her part, felt much as the kind-hearted, long-suffering owner of the china shop might have done after the exit of the bear. She tied on the pink, then the green apron, picked up all the scattered treasures and replaced them in her work basket, and straightened the rug. Then she set the lamp on the floor and began sharply examining the carpet. She even rubbed her fingers over it and looked at them. He's tracked in a good deal of dust, she murmured. I thought he must have. Louisa got a dustpan and brush and swept Joe Daggett's track carefully. If he could have known it, it would have increased his perplexity and uneasiness, although it would not have disturbed his loyalty in the least. He came twice a week to see Louisa Ellis, and every time sitting there in her delicately sweet room, he felt as if surrounded by a hedge of lace. He was afraid to stir lest he put a clumsy foot or hand through the fairy web, and he always had the consciousness that Louisa was watching fearfully, lest he should. Still, the lace and Louisa commanded perforce his perfect respect and patience and loyalty. 
They were to be married in a month, after a singular courtship which lasted for a matter of fifteen years. For fourteen out of the fifteen years the two had not once seen each other, and they seldom exchanged letters. Joe had been all those years in Australia, where he had gone to make his fortune, and where he had stayed until he made it. He would have stayed fifty years if it had taken so long, and come home feeble and tottering, or never come home at all, to marry Louisa. But the fortune had been made in the fourteen years, and he had come home now to marry the woman who had been patiently and unquestionably waiting for him all that time. Shortly after they were engaged, he had announced to Louisa his determination to strike out into new fields and secure a competency before they should be married. She had listened and assented with a sweet serenity which never failed her, not even when her lover set forth on that long and uncertain journey. Joe, buoyed up as he was by his sturdy determination, broke down a little at the last, but Louisa kissed him with a mild blush and said goodbye. It won't be long, poor Joe had said huskily, but it was for fourteen years. In that length of time, much had happened. Louisa's mother and brother had died, and she was all alone in the world. But, greatest happening of all, a subtle happening which both were too simple to understand, Louisa's feet had turned into a path, smooth, maybe, under a calm, serene sky, but so straight and unswerving that it could only meet a check at her grave, and so narrow that there was no room for anyone at her side. Louisa's first emotion when Joe Daggett came home, he had not apprised her of his coming, was consternation, although she would not admit it to herself, and he never dreamed of it. Fifteen years ago she had been in love with him, at least she considered herself to be. Just at that time, gently acquiescing with and falling into the natural drift of girlhood, she had seen the marriage ahead as a reasonable feature and a probable desirability of life. She had listened with calm docility to her mother's views upon the subject. Her mother was remarkable for her cool sense and sweet, even temperament. She talked wisely to her daughter when Joe Daggett presented himself, and Louisa accepted him with no hesitation. He was the first lover she had ever had. She had been faithful to him all these years. She had never dreamed of the possibility of marrying anyone else. Her life, especially for the last seven years, had been full of a pleasant peace. She had never felt discontented nor impatient of her lover's absence. Still, she had always looked forward to his return and their marriage as the inevitable conclusion of things. However, she had fallen into a way of placing it so far in the future that it was almost equal to placing it over the boundaries of another life. When Joe came, she had been expecting him and expecting to be married for fourteen years, but she was as much surprised and taken aback as if she had never thought of it. Joe's consternation came later. He eyed Louisa with an instant confirmation of his old admiration. She had changed but little. She still kept her pretty manner and soft grace, and was, he considered, every wit and attractive as ever. As for him, his stent was done. He had turned his face away from fortune-seeking, and the old winds of romance whistled as loud and sweet as ever through his ears. All the song which he had been wont to hear in them was Louisa. He had for a long time a loyal belief that he heard it still. But, finally... It seemed to him that although the winds sang always that one song, it had another name. But for Louisa, the wind had never more than murmured. Now it had gone down and everything was still. She listened for a little while with half-wistful attention. Then she turned quietly away and went to work on her wedding clothes. Joe had made some extensive and quite magnificent alterations in his house. It was the old homestead. The newly married couple would live there, for Joe could not desert his mother, who refused to leave her old home. So Louisa must leave hers. Every morning, rising and going about among her neat, maidenly possessions, 
she felt as one looking her last upon the faces of dear friends. It was true that, in a measure, she could take them with her, but, robbed of their old environments, they would appear in such new guises that they would almost cease to be themselves. Then there were some peculiar figures of her happy, solitary life which she would probably be obliged to relinquish altogether. Sterner tasks than these graceful but half-needless ones would probably devolve upon her. There would be a large house to care for. There would be company to entertain. There would be Joe's rigors and feeble old mother to wait upon. And it would be contrary to all thrifty village traditions for her to keep more than one servant— Louisa had a little still, and she used to occupy herself pleasantly in summer weather with distilling the sweet and aromatic essences from roses and peppermint and spearmint. By and by, her still must be laid away. Her store of essences was already considerable, and there would be no time for her to distill for the mere pleasure of it. Then Joe's mother would think it foolishness. She had already hinted her opinion in the matter. Louisa dearly loved to sew a linen seam, not always for use, but for the simple, mild pleasure which she took in it. She would have been loath to confess how more than once she had ripped a seam for the mere delight of sewing it together again. Sitting at her window during long, sweet afternoons, drawing her needle gently through the dainty fabric, she was peace itself. But there was small chance of such foolish comfort in the future. Joe's mother, domineering, shrewd old matron that she was even in her old age, and very likely even Joe himself with his honest, masculine rudeness, would laugh and frown down all these pretty but senseless old maiden ways. Louisa had almost the enthusiasm of an artist over the mere order and cleanliness of their solitary home. She had throbs of genuine triumph at the sight of the window panes which she had polished until they shone like jewels. She gloated gently over her orderly bureau drawers, with their exquisitely folded contents redolent with lavender and sweet clover and very purity. Could she be sure of the endurance of even this? She had visions so startling that she half repudiated them as indelicate, of coarse, masculine belongings strewn about in an endless litter of dust and disorder, arising necessarily from a coarse, masculine presence in the midst of all this delicate harmony. Among her forebodings of disturbance, not least was with regard to Caesar. Caesar was a veritable hermit of a dog. For the greater part of his life he had dwelt in his secluded hut, shut out from the society of his kind in all innocent canine joys. Never had Caesar since his early youth watched at a woodchuck's hole, never had he known the delights of a stray bone at a neighbor's kitchen door, and it was all on account of a sin committed when hardly out of puppyhood. No one knew the possible depth of remorse of which this mild-visaged, altogether innocent-looking old dog might be capable— but whether or not he had encountered remorse, he had encountered a full measure of righteous retribution. Old Caesar seldom lifted up his voice in a growl or a bark. He was fat and sleepy. There were yellow rings which looked like spectacles around his dim old eyes. But there was a neighbor who bore on his hand the imprint of several of Caesar's sharp, white, youthful teeth, and for that he had lived at the end of a chain, all alone in a little hut, for fourteen years. The neighbor, who was choleric and smarting with the pain of his wound, had demanded either Caesar's death or complete ostracism. So Louise's brother, to whom the dog had belonged, had built him his little kennel and tied him up. It was now fourteen years since, in a flood of youthful spirits, he had inflicted that memorable bite, and with the exception of short excursions always at the end of the chain, under the strict guardianship of his master or Louisa, the old dog had remained a close prisoner. It is doubtful if, with his limited ambition, he took much pride in the fact, but it is certain he was possessed of considerable cheap fame. He was regarded by all the children in the village, and by many adults, as a very monster of ferocity. St. George's dragon could hardly have surpassed in evil repute Louisa Ellis's old yellow dog. Mothers charged their children with sullen emphasis not to go too near him, and the children listened and believed greedily with a fascinated appetite for terror, and ran by Louisa's house stealthily, 
with many sidelong and backward glances at the terrible dog. If perchance he sounded a hoarse bark, there was panic. Wayfarers chancing into Louise's yard eyed him with respect, and inquired if the chain were stout. Caesar at large might have seemed a very ordinary dog, and excited no comment whatsoever, chained his reputation overshadowed him so that he lost his own proper outlines and looked darkly vague and enormous joe daggett however with his good-humoured sense and shrewdness saw him as he was he strode valiantly up to him and patted him on the head in spite of louise's soft clamour of warning and even attempted to set him loose Louisa grew so alarmed that he desisted, but kept announcing his opinion at the matter quite forcibly at intervals. "'There ain't a better-natured dog in this town,' he would say, "'and it's downright cruel to keep him tied up there. Some day I'm going to take him out.' Louisa had very little hope that he would not, one of these days, when their interests and possessions should be more completely fused in one. She pictured to herself Caesar on the rampage in this quiet and unguarded village— she saw innocent children bleeding in his path. She was herself very fond of the old dog, because he had belonged to her dead brother, and he was always gentle with her. Still, she had great faith in his ferocity. She always warned people not to go too near him. She fed him on aesthetic fare of corn mush and cakes, and never fired his dangerous temper with heating and sanguinary diet of flesh and bones. Louisa looked at the old dog munching at his simple fare, and thought of her approaching marriage, and trembled. Still, no anticipation of disorder and confusion in lieu of sweet peace and harmony, no forebodings of Caesar on the rampage, no wild fluttering of her little yellow canary, were sufficient to turn her a hair's breadth. Joe Diet had been fond of her, and working for her, all his years. It was not for her whatever came to pass to prove untrue and break his heart. She put the exquisite little stitches into her wedding garments, and time went on until it was only a week before her wedding day. It was a Tuesday evening, and the wedding was to be a week from Wednesday. There was a full moon that night. About nine o'clock, Louisa strolled down the road a little way. There were harvest fields on either hand, bordered by low stone walls. Luxuriant clumps of trees grew beside the wall, and trees, wild cherry and old apple trees, at intervals. Presently, Louisa sat down on the wall, and looked about her with mildly sorrowful reflectiveness. Tall shrubs of blueberry and meadowsweet, all woven together and tangled with blackberry vines and horsebriars, shut her in on either side. She had a little clear space between. Opposite her, on the other side of the road, there was a spreading tree. The moon shone between its boughs, and the leaves twinkled like silver. The road was bespread with a beautiful shifting dapple of silver and shadow. The air was full of a mysterious sweetness. I wonder if it's wild grapes, murmured Louisa. She sat there some time. She was just thinking of rising when she heard footsteps and low voices and remained quiet. It was a lonely place, and she felt a little timid. She thought she would keep still in the shadow and let the persons, whoever they might be, pass her. But just before they reached her, the voices ceased, and the footsteps. She understood that their owners had also found seats upon the stone wall. She was wondering if she could not steal away unobserved when the voice broke the stillness. It was Joe Daggett's. She sat still and listened. The voice was announced by a loud sigh, which was as familiar as itself. Well, said Daggett, you've made up your mind then, I suppose. Yes, returned another voice. I'm going, day after tomorrow. That's Lily Dyer, thought Louisa to herself. The voice embodied itself in her mind. She, taught, she saw a girl, tall and full-figured, with a firm, fair face, looking fairer and firmer in the moonlight, her strong yellow hair braided in a close knot. A girl full of a calm, rustic strength and bloom, with a masterful way which might have beseemed a princess. Lily Dyer was a favorite with the village folk. She had just the qualities to arouse the admiration. She was good and handsome and smart. 
Louisa had often heard her praises sounded. Well, said Joe Daggett, I ain't got a word to say. I don't know what you could say, returned Lily Dyer. Not a word to say, repeated Joe, drawing out the words heavily. Then there was silence. I ain't sorry, he began at last, that that happened yesterday, that we kind of let on how we felt to each other. I guess it's just as well we knew. Of course, I can't go do anything any different. Going right on and get married next week. I ain't going back on a woman that's waited on me fourteen years and break her heart. If you should jilt her tomorrow, I wouldn't have you, spoke up the girl with sudden vehemence. Well, I ain't going to give you the chance, said he, but I don't believe you would either. You should see I wouldn't honor's honor and right's right, and I ain't never think anything of any man that went against him for me or any other girl. You'd find that out, Joe Daggett. Well, you'd find out fast enough that I ain't going against him for you or any other girl, returned he. The voices sounded almost as if they were angry with each other. Louisa was listening eagerly. I'm sorry you feel as if you must go away, said Joe, but I don't know that it's best. Of course it's best. I hope you and I have some common sense. Well, I suppose you're right. Suddenly, Joe's voice got an undertone of tenderness. Say, Lily, said he. I'll get along well enough myself, but I can't bear to think. You don't suppose you're going to fret much over it. I guess you'll find out I shan't fret it much over a married man. Well, I I hope you won't. I, I hope you won't, Lily. God knows I do, and I hope one of these days you'll come across somebody else. I don't see any reason why I shouldn't. Suddenly, her tone changed. She spoke in a sweet, clear voice, so loud she could have been heard across the street. No, Joe Daggett, said she. I'll never marry any other man as long as I live. I've got good sense, and I ain't going to break my heart nor make a fool of myself. But I'm never going to be married, you can be sure of that. I ain't that sort of girl to feel this same way twice. Louisa heard an exclamation and soft commotion behind the bushes. Then Lily spoke again. The voice sounded as if she had risen. This must be put a stop to, said she. We've stayed here long enough. I'm going home. Louisa sat there in a daze, listening to their retreating steps. After a while, she got up and slunk home softly herself. The next day, she did her housework methodically. That was as much of a matter, of course, as breathing, but she did not sew on her wedding clothes. She sat at her window and meditated. In the evening, Joe came. Louisa Ellis had never known that she had any diplomacy in her, but when she came to look for it that night, she found it, although meek of its kind, among her little feminine weapons. Even now she could hardly believe that she had heard all right, and that she would not do Joe a terrible injury should she break her troth plight. She wanted to sound him without betraying too soon her own inclinations in the matter. She did it successfully, and they finally came to an understanding, but it was a difficult thing, for he was as afraid of betraying himself as she. She never mentioned Lily Dyer. She simply said that while she had no cause of complaint against him, she had lived so long in one way that she shrank from making a change. Well, I never shrank, Louisa, said Daggett. I'm going to be honest enough to say that I think maybe it's better this way, but if you'd wanted to keep on, I'd have stuck with you till my dying day. I hope you know that. Yes, I do, said she. That night, she and Joe parted more tenderly than they had done for a long time. Standing in the door, holding each other's hands, at last a great wave of regretful memory swept over them. Well, this ain't the way we thought it was all going to end, is it, Louisa? said Joe. She shook her head. There was a little quiver on her placid face. 
You let me know if there's ever anything I can do for you, said he. I ain't ever going to forget you, Louisa. Then he kissed her and went down the path. Louisa, all alone by herself that night, wept a little. She hardly knew why. But the next morning, on waking, she felt like a queen, who, after fearing lest her domain be wrested from her, sees it firmly insured in her possession. Now the tall weeds and grasses might cluster around Caesar's little hermit hut, the snow might fall on its roof year in and year out, but he would never go out on a rampage through the unguarded village. Now the little canary might turn itself into a peaceful yellow ball night after night, and have no need to wink and flutter with wild terror against its bars. Louisa could sew linen seams, and distill roses, and dust, and polish, and fold away in lavender as long as she listed. That afternoon she sat with her needlework at the window, and went fairly steeped in peace. Lily Dyer, tall and erect and blooming, went past, but she felt no qualm. If Louisa Ellis had sold her birthright, she did not know it. The taste of pottage was so delicious, and had been her sole satisfaction for so long. Serenity and placid narrowness had become to her as the birthright itself. She gazed ahead through a long reach of future days strung together like pearls in a rosary, every one like the others, and all smooth and flawless and innocent, and her heart went up in thankfulness. Outside was the fervid summer afternoon. The air was filled with the sound of busy harvest of men and birds and bees. There were halloos, mechanic clatterings, sweet calls, and long hummings. Louisa sat, prayerfully numbering her days, like an uncloistered nun. The end. So Mary E. Wilkins Freeman, her life is... I don't want to say similar to the protagonist because she did get married, but it was kind of, it was similar in the sense that her parents both died very suddenly and she supported herself through writing and she had actually published two books of short stories, which include one, the latter of which included this story. Um, I think it was the A New England Nun and other stories. She supported herself with her writing for a, a decent amount of time and then she met her husband and they had a lengthy courtship homeboy that she married was very very disruptive to her life in much the same like i'm gonna say in much the same way as joe daggett was but joe daggett wasn't an alcoholic and womanizer and wasn't um in a mental institution when they legally separated <laughs> there's a theme that i really enjoy reading and i I don't get to read it very often, so that's why I, part of why I really wanted to read this story. And that theme is the idea of someone getting something that they were not allowed to want. Which is what Louise is- like, she just- she just wants to be alone. Like, she just wants her little house and her little- her, her little succulents and dumb dino pots and things like that. I've always felt a really deep affinity for that kind of story because it's just so interesting to unpack every single time it comes around. Uh, another one that does this really well is Story of an Hour by Kate Chopin, which we have not yet read. If I do end up reading it, I will link it up in a card up there. Now it seems like wanting to live on your own, like that's not really any kind of big deal anymore. I do think there is a bit of an expectation, especially among, you know, the elder millennials such as myself and older, that you will add eventually settle down with some nice fellow, etc, etc. I feel like now it's kind of more accepted to just live the life you love, you know? There are a few things that I really dig about this particular story and Mary E. Wilkins Freeman's writing style in this particular story. One thing is her repetition of items with and in between. She always lists three and there's always an and in between. Like right at the very beginning when she when it's talking about how night is coming and it says that there's a very premonition of rest and hush and night and it's it doesn't really have significance to the story per se but it's just such a nice rhythm and beat and poetic device to that she repeats that throughout the entire thing i, I dig that a lot 
A couple things to notice in terms of like overall themes of this story. Caesar the dog is a very big metaphor and Luis's uh, impressions of Caesar the dog that she's just horrified that he's gonna go bite somebody and Joe Daggett's like, oh no, it's fine. He's a dog. Just let him go. He's a dog. Who cares? And they're complete at odds of that is very um, indicative of their kind of worldviews. Like, Luisa is very clearly like, this is my bubble, this is my house, I'm afraid of everything else, leave me alone. And that's kind of why she found out, finds out the whole thing with Lily Dyer is because she's afraid, she hears somebody, she's like, oh no, I'm afraid to move. But who's it gonna be, Luisa? A town person that you know and knows you? Who, who do you think it's gonna be, Luisa? At the same time, you can't, you can't really dismiss her as silly or whatever because that's just her. That's how she has learned to live on her own for the past 14 years. And of course, the canary too is like a metaphor for her. Like she's the fluttery canary and she's freaking out. And now that Joe Daggett's not going to be here, she's nice and calm. One last thing to watch for as you, I hope, rewatch the video. <laughs> but she very explicitly describes the colors of everything in Luisa's life in her house, except when Joe is there. Her Caesar is not just the dog, he is the yellow and white dog. Um, her canary is the yellow canary. Her apron, she wears the green apron with the hat with the green ribbon. And it's not like, like usually, as a writer, you hear the advice like, don't say it's green, say it is chartreuse. You know, like, you're not supposed to say it's green. You're supposed to be more descriptive. Um, but she repeatedly says white, pink, blue, green. Like, it's just very simple, simple colors. But she never uses color when Joe Daggett is there. And it's interesting because her life is colorful but simple until this dude comes around, you know? I'm just saying. And it's funny that I keep talking about what I liked about the story as opposed to, you know, actual, like, critical analysis stuff. Part of it is that Mary E. Wilkins Freeman likes to write her stories with slightly older female protagonist. So we will see her again on this channel for sure because that just tickles my fancy. Like, hello, I identify with that strongly for, you know, no apparent reason. So I hope you enjoyed the story and the analysis and I hope that you liked it enough to like and subscribe because that's, that's a thing that you have to say on YouTube. But I will see you guys next time.